Welcome to the Depression to Expression podcast, my friends. Welcome back. It's been a while. Now, you all know that I did the TEDx talk called Why You Should Question Everything, right? The, the power of curiosity and asking great questions to solve life's most intense challenges. So obviously, the guest on my podcast today, we met because she wrote a book called The Power of Curiosity. She helps parents, executives have difficult conversations and go through life challenges with this attitude of curiosity. Isn't that incredible? So obviously we connected because we see the world in a very similar way. The power of curiosity, the power of asking questions, the power of having an open mind. That's what we're going to talk about today. Okay. Being being a parent today is very difficult. Being an educator, being an employee, being a human being is difficult today. And sometimes we have trouble expressing ourselves. Geez, in mental health, if we're going through difficult times, how do we open up? How do we talk to other people? This is what we're going to talk about today. Now, what's really cool about Kirsten and I is, oh my gosh, I'm smiling right now if you can't tell. Um, We did our very first parent group, myself and her, talking about internet safety, screen time, and social media for kids We spoke to parents of grade five students. So what we do and what we're going to continue to do in 2020 a lot of times is go through the city of Toronto and and anywhere, anywhere people will have us. And I talk about, you know, being an influencer, being on social media, the impacts of mental health, my experience at Twitter, social media agencies, uh, the parents are interested in tracking and data and what the internet and tech companies know about you. I go through that and then Kirsten comes in and she talks about, okay, how do we have this discussion with our kids? How do we have a relatable conversation? So we're, we're really, really working together and I'm so happy that she's here with me because you know, you're going to hear a lot more from her. You're going to see videos. You're going to see pictures of us uh, on Instagram, on YouTube, of us working together in the education system. So Kirsten, here we go, everyone. Thanks for staying tuned. Remember, all merch... What am I going to say here? Yes, all merch that you buy at shop.depressiontoexpression.com funds this channel. You're then welcomed into our online community where we use the app Discord and have chats with people all over the world. If you want to see what that's like, well, one of my latest videos on YouTube is a few of us patrons. We're doing the live stream together and streaming on YouTube. It's so fun. Check out depressiontoexpression.com and just learn more about what's going on. Man, it's such... I have the best job in the world. Okay, I'll shut up now. Here's Kirsten Siggins with me in three, two, one. Kirsten, welcome to the Depression to Expression podcast. You have a business with the greatest name I have ever heard. And to be honest, uh, I think I'm a little jealous that you that you took it before me. My friends, she's the co-founder of the Institute of of curiosity those of you who have followed me for quite some time know that that word and asking questions based on that old TEDx talk curiosity is what I live for to learn more to become a better person to question the world that we live in why do you think curiosity is such an important thing Kirsten that's a loaded question. <laughs> Such a loaded question. I, I mean, I think curiosity is the essence of life. For me, I think that, you know, what I've learned is there's no right or wrong way of doing anything. And as long as we're curious, we can always learn and more importantly, understand. So when we look at curiosity, we look at it in the context of conversations. Um, and so for us, it's really about how do you have curious conversations? Because I think most people believe they're curious in life. We all read books or have passions or want to know what's in a box but where we are not curious what we've realized is in our conversations and when we're not curious in conversations we judge and blame and shame and get stuck in a right wrong headspace and all of it leads to conflict so when you can be curious and you can see here and understand people you approach a conversation very differently because you're taking the focus off of self to better understand others right so we get out of our own way and then we learn things that we would not normally learn so curiosity for me is is like the essence of everything where because that's how we inspire ourselves that's how we engage that's how we understand that's how we learn um and i think it's the foundation of a happy life personally i think i i agree with you there i think we the reason you're sitting on the couch here is a because you're an amazing person thank you so much for coming thank you for having me this is the little makeshift studio (laughs) but um 
we the conversation we had over the phone, and we'll get more about your business and the Institute of Curiosity, but our conversation on the phone, uh, it was supposed to just be a quick hello. I think it was like 40 minutes we spent because you'd ask me a question, I would respond, and then I'd be so excited to ask you a question back because I know you'd be so grateful that I asked you something because your answer would just be, be filled with... Um, you you just the the curiosity sparked this this whole conversation that we had over the phone and there was so much give and take in that conversation it wasn't just me asking you questions and then there'd be a pause and you'd wait for another there's a beautiful exchange do you think that's a lost art in conversation now where there's a lot of of you know talking not enough listening based on both parties? Yes, 100%, yes. But you have to remember, we're not taught how to listen, number one. And two, we live in such a, a technology-dominated world. I mean, if you're over the age of 40, like I am, there was a time, all we had was conversation growing up. That's all we knew, that's all we had. And I think that with the advances in technology, that's changed. So you don't have to have conversations. In fact, working with parents, a lot of the times they use text as the best, for them, that they find it's the best method of communication with their kids. So if we're not practicing conversations at home and we're not practicing conversations with our friends at school and you see a lot of kids that are texting and they're all standing together, but they're texting each other or they're finding ways to use their technology to communicate, it becomes difficult to have conversations. And conversations, they're skills that we have to learn and develop. And there's this huge assumption that we all know how to do it and, and we don't. And listening is a huge part of that. Asking questions is a huge part of it. I mean, I don't know, you're younger than I am. So how, how were you taught the skills of communication? Uh, were you taught to have conversations? Was that no, part but, of but it came naturally because I, we didn't have the phone at the time. So if, right. you want, if you wanted to get through to someone, you had to knock on the door or you had to call their home phone and you'd usually get their mom or dad first. So then you hi, is Joel there, please? Thank you. And then you'd then talk to the person on the phone. Okay, you want to meet here. And then you'd have that in-person conversation. Um, now it's maybe not a, not a lost art, but there are now alternatives to have yeah. that in-person conversation. And you think of what a conversation entails. It's There's a lot going on. To be able to think of, of what to say next, but while also listening, while also coming up with yes, a response by being present there. There's a lot going on where text is, you, you have time to respond. You don't need to be present in that moment. Do you think with kids now, they're choosing text because maybe it is easier as far as response time and not having to be that aware? I, you know, I love that you said that. So when I work with teens, yeah, that was consistent feedback I'd get from them mm. where we would talk about especially difficult conversations and that would be something they would struggle with. And so when you talked about how you have a conversation, they would say things like, well, you know, we don't have conversations because with texting, you can edit, you can control, you can be funny, you can set the tone, you can, you know, so it's a, it's a place of putting your best foot forward and you're in complete control of that. Whereas in real time conversations, they felt that they couldn't control any of that. So they shied away from them altogether interesting so I think there's a lot of truth to that do you know how much easier it is to bomb at a joke over text than in person <laughs> like think about that fear as a as a child and the fear of failure you go out for you say a joke nobody laughs oh that hurts but over text well maybe you get a ha ha instead of an LMFAO you know what I mean it's not as it's not as intimidating um, so when you're working with teens let's talk about the Institute of Curiosity for a second um, what kind of work do you do? I know you do a lot with, with parents as well, but you also work with, with teens. So I started What's, what's it out, all about? Yeah. So I should first say, so the Institute of Curiosity is very unique from the perspective that it's a very small business. It's my mom and I. So my mom is my business partner, which is like, I can hear people gasping already like, <gasps> you know, who works with their mother? Uh, but you know, the truth of the matter is, is that, how, how should I say this? That was awkward. Um, we had a great relationship beforehand, but if somebody had said to me 10 years ago, you're going to work with your mother, I would have laughed them out of the room, right? I love my mom. She was amazing. It's the, it's the communication skills that we taught and came up with through the process of being curious and coaching other people that actually made it viable for us to have a business together. So we both started out as executive coaches. I worked in the entertainment industry. Uh, my mom worked in healthcare. 
And she was teaching coach approaches to doctors and nurses and, you know, leaders in healthcare. It was how to have a coaching conversation, so to speak. And the feedback was that's great and everything. But the part that's really interesting is this part about being curious. And so we played with it and we investigated and we learned that if you are curious in conversations, you can actually control your emotions. So you can have those challenging conversations and stay in that, if you stay in that place of curiosity, you can stay calm and connected in those challenging conversations. And the neuroscience supports that, which I'm happy to talk about. Mm. So we, it started out more as a leadership component and I was um, coaching people in the entertainment industry and we started teaching these skills and there was sort of two ahas that came out for me. One was that everybody struggles with communication skills. It doesn't matter if you're leading a company or you're a stay-at-home mom or whatever, it doesn't matter what you do, these are skills that are not taught. Uh, that's why we hear our parents' voices coming out of our mouths when our back is up against the wall, right? We do what we know, even if it's not successful. And the second point that I realized was, you know, how we show up as parents it has such a huge influence on our kids. And I had young kids at the time. And But we wait until we're leaders. We wait until we need to make more money or we want to raise or there's something that there's a reward uh, or motivation to invest in ourselves to be better communicators, right? It's never because I want to be a better parent or I want to be a better spouse or partner or friend or whatever. It was always sort of work related. So I thought to myself, okay, what if we turned up, if, if parents learn these skills that we taught them to their kids from the get-go, you wouldn't have to wait until you were in a leadership place mm. to learn these skills. So my passion became about working with parents and working with teenagers. So in LA, I did some work with teenagers and it was, I learned more from them, I think, than they learned from me about how they looked at communication and how, it, you know, feedback was my parents had all this time to listen to me and they never did. And now that I'm a teen, all they want me to do is to listen to them. But if they're not going to listen to me, why should I listen to them? Mm. You know, so they do what we do, not what we tell them to do. And I think as parents, we, I always say this, we take our best to work and we bring our leftovers home and we don't even recognize that we're doing it, right? So we take our best to work because our clients are paying us that. And so we're present and we're listening and we're doing all the things that you're saying. Then we come home at the end of the day and we're exhausted and we're tired and homework needs to be done and you got to put food on the table and do your, you know, there's laundry and dishes and a million different things and we're not as present and we're not as aware of how we're showing up and we're more emotionally triggered. And then our kids go to school and they take their best to school and they bring their leftovers home. So they're emotionally fraught and we have these really challenging conversations. Um, and then it's, those are the patterns that we're setting, we're instilling for life, right? That's how essentially when we become leaders, that's how we're gonna show up as leaders because that's what we know. That's, so it's how can you switch that? How can you come home and be more present and be more curious with your kids to understand them so you can teach them these communication skills so that you know you can have conversations where you understand each other hmm. I, I, I wonder because we, we spoke about this before we turn on the microphones can you teach well I, I guess you can but how do you teach someone to be curious I give the example of uh, you know some people are in just awe of the world that they live in and they live to wonder and to ask questions. Like you came into my condo, you're like, sweet view, this is awesome. I'm like, yeah, look at the clouds, isn't that awesome? Look, you can see the planes take off. How does a plane work? That's the way my mind works. But as I gave the example, some people come in the condo and they just wanna watch the TV or they're inspired by something else. Some people like the whiteboard I have more than the view. Right. Yeah, so can you teach curiosity? Is there something more innate in some people than there is in others um, with this sense of awe and wonder? I don't know. I mean, it's a good question. I think if you, t in terms of teaching curiosity in conversations, yes, because that's what we do. In terms of teaching curiosity in life, I think it's important to remember we're all motivated and curious about different things. It doesn't make one thing better than the other. It just makes it different. And it's finding out what we're passionate about and what we're curious about and what motivates us. I think that when it, comes to you know if you're talking about curiosity in terms of conversation sort of what you're saying when you come in and you see how people respond we're we're not taught we're taught we we have to get out of our own way is what i'm trying to say mm -hmm. right we're so in our own way so we don't when we speak we don't think to engage others we don't think 
about we, we just look at it differently we're speaking to get our point across we're speaking to be heard we're not listening to understand so a lot of how we live our life is focused on self mm. it's getting out of your own way to recognize and understanding other that's what sparks the curiosity but not all of us get to that point it's a choice i think that we can make but we have to choose to be mm. that way we have to choose to be present we have to be we have to choose to get out of our own, own way to engage with others to learn about them we have to choose to want to listen to be open to different perspectives and i think a lot of people hear a different perspective and then we go to that right wrong mindset and we want to shut it down because if it's different than our own and it's not right then it must be wrong and it becomes positional and judgmental. Yeah. And I, I think it's difficult to be curious in those. You can be curious, but it's a choice that you have to make. Right. I, I think, oh my gosh, getting out of your own way. That's So we could talk about social media. I think there's a beautiful culture of narcissism coming out in the world. Even myself, I edit my own videos. I'm looking at my face. You have to keep track of this metric and this. And of course you know, having your own business too, you're constantly, um, you know, you're, you have a million hats on, you have to be worried about your own, your own state of affairs. I think that's really, really difficult for people, myself included, to get out of your own way. There's this awesome speech by Albert Einstein. And uh, just, I'm not uh, just paraphrasing it. He's like, anyone who's ever thought for more than a second, really realizes that we exist solely for other people. Like, and it's so true. If you mm -hmm. ask maybe the, the five whys, if you say, what do you want? He asks, why do you want that? And why do you want that? Why do you want that? At the end of the whys, you're always going to usually come back to either I want to be more happy. And what does that mean? Probably mm -hmm. having more friends, more community, doing something for your family, for someone else. Um, getting out of your own way is fantastic. Is there a way that you can do that? Is there mindfulness practices that you teach? Is there... Uh, changing your physical state that helps is there anything around that <laughs> I would say getting the easiest way to get out of your own way is to be curious about understanding others okay it, for me that's what I that was how I did it and that that's how we help other people do it right so to get out of your own way is recognizing that it's not just about you it's not just your one way it's okay having a conversation this isn't just about me I want to see, hear, and understand somebody else. I want to listen to those different perspectives. But part of that is being open to understanding different perspectives and suspending our judgment, that little voice that we have in our head, and, and not going to that place of being right or wrong, being able to listen to something that you don't like or agree with and still being open to hear it. It doesn't mean you have to adopt it on as your perspective, but I think that that's where, you know, when you look at our culture, or you look at social media, it can be very positional. And it's not always the best place to have productive conversations because they do become very positional. They become, no, this is right or this is wrong or and judgmental. Where we get stuck in our own way is when we can't be, from, from my perspective, we're just not open and curious to understand what's going on for other people. Mm. And, you know, there's a great quote, and I can't remember who said it, but, you know, where it's understanding is another name for love. And really, we just all want to be understood. And it doesn't mean that we have to like what other people say or agree with what people say. But when we understand them, it changes how we have relationships. Totally. Right? And and that's the piece that you, you need curiosity to understand others. Yes. And you need to get out of your own way in order to understand others. I think that's huge in the political sphere, too, where you have this yes. big polarization, right? And people won't even stop and almost take the emotion out of it too and be like, how can I best understand the other person's position on this and this and this? That's, I think that's a massive part Not and, and in business too. Do you feel like people are usually looking for, and I'm guilty of this, uh, looking for an equal exchange when trying to have these conversations? And what I mean is why should I be curious, ask this person all these questions, seek to understand if I already know I'm right? So what's the point of engaging in this conversation, learning more when I already know it's my way or the highway, this is the best way to do it anyways? Well, if you already know that you're right, I mean, it's then why have the conversation? I think what I'm trying to say is getting out of that perspective of thinking of things of right and wrong and just looking at them as being different. It doesn't mean you have to change how you do anything, but we can't learn unless we're open to understanding different perspectives. So, you know, when you... 
if, if we go through life thinking, I'm going to ask the question, but I'm still, I know I'm right, then we're closed down. We're not actually going to learn anything. So we're still in our own way. We're getting in our own way. What's the point of having that conversation? And how is the other person you're talking to going to feel? Mm. But, but if you're asking the question to learn and to be curious to understand, it doesn't mean that you're not right or not wrong. It doesn't mean you have to change your perspective, but you will be open to listening to it differently. So you might actually learn something and you might look at it differently. But when we get into that positional, the moment that anybody thinks they have the best idea or the right idea, they stop listening. There's it, literally our brain just shuts down because and you go into a meeting or parents, you know, when you're talking to your kids or with your friends or whatever, if you get into a conversation like that, the moment that you think that you're right or that you have the best idea, you're not going to listen to understand anybody else because you've already made up your mind with that. So we just miss a lot in conversations. We miss the opportunity to build richer relationships and and to deepen those relationships. Is this what happens, you know, the school systems could be thought of as, you know, maybe neglecting this state of curiosity by, you know, it's usually a one-way conversation with lecture, geez, university, lecturer, students. It's been the same for hundreds of years yep is there a way you know what are your thoughts on the school system and what we're how we're teaching kids you can be honest on the podcast how much time do you have <laughs> but it's hard because i bet a lot of people in the system and, and teachers would agree with yeah well we'll see we'll see what you say here first uh, what what needs to change does anything need to change how big would these changes need to be I think it's it's not a simple question. I for me it's it's a, it's so many tiers. So one, I feel like yes, the school system needs to change. I it's it's not working for us in a way that's effective and a lot of people would say that. I mm -hmm. think we're really good at teaching our kids to be obedient. I question whether we're successfully teaching them to be critical thinkers. I think that the education, my understanding is the education system hasn't changed in a lot of years and our world is changing so quickly. So the, the skills and the need for education has, is also changing and it's hard to keep up with it. So it's trying to figure out, you know, what is it that our kids need to be successful? And I, I think that's part of the problem is not, people don't really know yet and it's changing so quickly. I mean, I think for the first time ever, we can't really foresee what 10 years from now is gonna look like. Right. But when I was a kid, you know, my parents could pretty much guarantee, maybe not guarantee, but they had a pretty decent idea what my experience was going to be like as a child, my schooling experience, you know, what the expectation was. They, you know, 10 years, you could predict what was going to happen just because we didn't have the changes that are going on now. Mm. So it's really hard to answer these questions because I, I think part of the struggle is, is people don't really know. Is it working the way it is now? From my perspective, no. I don't think it is working. I think that we're rooted in a very old system that is not giving the kids the skills that they need. They need to learn how to be critical thinkers because we don't know what's coming around the bend. Mm. And yet our school system is still very much rigid and built on obedience of, you know, this is the knowledge you need to know. I mean, my son is in eighth grade and he's constantly saying, how am I going to use any of this information? <laughs> well, I was asking, you were probably asking the same question too in school. We all do. A hundred percent. And part of it is the process of thinking and learning and sifting through it. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I think there's room to do it. I there's room to do a better job with that in some schools. I, excuse me, some schools I think are doing that now, but it's, it's 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 not a one size fits all. It's not a one specific answer. I think it's a mm -hmm. bigger question that needs you know teachers need different training. Social media is a perfect example of that. Mental health is a perfect example of that. Those are things that our our teachers need training in. Our parents yeah. need a deeper understanding of all of this stuff yeah. and how it crosses over into school. And that you know, we're only now I'm now only starting to see that in the schools. Mm. Um, Isn't it interesting that. You know, I know a, a lot of people where we graduate university and learning for me is so much more fun than it ever was at school. And I, I took a bunch of different courses and electives because I like to learn a little bit about everything. But having no curriculum, no time frame, learning exactly what I want to learn and how it can actually be applied to today. So my dad gave me a great example. It's like we're learning algebra in high school and we just start, okay, guys, what is X equal? I'm like, what the hell? What do you mean X? 
Why are we solving for X? What does this actually mean? Right. What are we doing? I'd be so frustrated. No wonder kids don't like math. But what if we took a step back, learned about Isaac Newton, learned right. about what he was trying to accomplish with algebra, learned about, okay, this is how we got man on the moon because we did this and this and this. Is this what algebra allows us to do? Rather than literally day one, let's solve for X. Right. It There's huge gaps in education like yeah. that. And maybe that does stifle curiosity because people are like, what's what's the point anyways if you're going to tell me what to do? And it goes back to your point of obedience. How do we get people to think more critically? I this, You know, it's a great question. These are skills that we have to, again, they're skills that we have to practice. I don't, not all teachers want their kids to think critically. Sometimes that's more work for them. You know, it's one of those things that it's the chicken and the egg. And and what does that look like? And how do you how do you teach those? We know our kids need those skills. And it's interesting because in a lot of meetings that I go into, it's like whose job is that? Is it the parent's job or is it the teacher's job? Yeah. Right. Yeah. And then there's debate over that. And, right. And her and but it's not solving for the. It's still not solving the the problem. And I and part of it I think is as kids get older, when they're younger, parents are very much in command control and they need to control what their kids are doing because their lives depend upon it. As they become a little bit more independent, like five six, they get into elementary school you're in kindergarten first grade and they do become a little bit more independent you know parents tend to back off but you still need to have hands-on and have control over the younger years but as they become into the teenage years and other you know social media comes into play mental health comes into play drug sex all of these things that are terrifying for parents mm -hmm. they tend to go back into command and control but really what we need to do is shift into thinking partner with our kids because our kids want that autonomy and you know as a cliche as it sounds because you hear this all the time it's like we got to let our kids fail we have to let our kids learn you know these things and when you have the helicopter parent the snowplow parent the drone parent i mean every year I feel like there's a new term that's coming out as parents <laughs> part of it is we're scared because we don't know what's happening in 10 years things are changing so quickly you know we don't our kids are just little petri dishes we still don't know the effects of a lot of this stuff mm -hmm. on long-term effects and how it's gonna help them hurt them whatever and and so we go into command and control because we just want to keep them safe but the reality is is that we have to learn how to shift to be that thinking partner with them so that we can give them that autonomy over their lives in a safe space to build those skills like critical thinking so that they can start solving their problems themselves. Because ultimately, those are the skills that they're going to need as they get older. I mean, think about it now. You run your own business. You wear all these hats. Mm -hmm. You know, what are the skills that are most important for you to be the most successful? Was it solving for why? <laughs> right. Is it time management? Is exactly. it, you know, I mean, it's, and so it's figuring out, understanding expectations, setting expectations, setting goals, meeting goals, you know, trusting that you're capable of doing these things. And I, those are the skills that we talk about as soft skills, but we don't teach and we don't implement and practice. And, and they're just like every other skill. So it's just shifting. We're now shifting into a different world and we haven't really kind of caught up with it. Right. It, it's and it's moving so fast so exponentially fast. fast yeah it's it's incredible when i do talks with with kids i sh i show them my first cell phone that i had it was the dual flip samsung and it's you know you send text 10 cents a text like it was unbelievable and that was my lifetime that was in university and now here we are iphone x it's like in all these new social media platforms it's moving so fast that yeah we're at a time where you can't predict where the next 10 years will be or you can make predictions and the predictions are a little scary with VR, 5G, mm -hmm. quantum computing. It's unbelievable. And what happens in schools too is, is you're looking to, I think we can all agree that soft skills are really important, but it's actually to overhaul what the curriculum or each class and really how do you teach these things and how do you actually uh, grade and evaluate soft skills. It's like a whole overhaul that geez, you think of what needs to change, and that's pretty intimidating. When you work with parents, what's what's usually a roadblock for parents to have these discussions with kids? Because a lot of what I get, too, is like the, the child will come home, boom, right to the room, yeah. or right to the computer, right to the phone, and they don't want to talk. Right. What does a parent do when their child doesn't want to talk about issues? Well, and it goes back to, I think, what I learned with the teens. I, it's always it, so... 
I started as I went through my journey it was really interesting because I thought okay I'm going to work with parents and then parents would say no I, I don't it's not about me it's about my kid my kid just needs to change right right or my spouse needs to change Every, my boss needs to change everybody needed to change but them uh-huh. and they just didn't want to do the work and so I thought okay well I'll go with teens because teens really love these skills and they wanted these skills and they were so happy to have these skills and then I would end up having a hard time in the world of education because it was, you know, well, that you're taking the, this is somebody else's job and it became very competitive. So that I went back to parents with a different perspective. And the reality of it is, is that it starts with us as parents. When we show up differently, our kids are going to show up differently. And that's that shifting from command and control into thinking partner. So we have to recognize being a teenager is very hard. I remember being a teenager, it was very hard. It was not an easy thing to do. There's a lot of expectation that is on them. It's a confusing time, you know, so there's a lot that's going on in their life. There's fears that our kids have that we never had to have growing up, you know, so I think we have to be sensitive to all of those things and and recognize that they want autonomy over their own life and that if they don't want to have a conversation when we want to have a conversation, it doesn't mean they don't want to talk about it. It just means that we have to be the adult in the relationship and recognize, okay, this isn't the right time for you, but I am here for you no matter what. And when you're there with them, you have to be present. It means putting down your phone. You have to be listening, right? Mm -hmm. Not to judge, not to lecture, not to tell them what they are or aren't doing, just listening. So we have to listen more and talk less. Mm. And then when we are talking, it's asking those questions to better understand. And that's hard for parents when they hear things they don't like and they hear things they disagree with um, and or they they recognize their kids have a different set of values. I know that's hard for parents because parents think that their kids have the same values and while they may share the same values, they might define them differently. And so those are all the things that, that are hard for parents. Uh, if you wanna have a relationship with your kid where you can have those difficult conversations, it's our job to check in we have to have that self-awareness right we have to get out of our own way and recognize okay i'm not going to take this personally i just need to see here and understand what's going on for my kid and that just means being present listening and then being focused on understanding Hmm. how do you how do you bridge how do you toe that line between um being your son or daughter's best bud You know, those parents that just wanted to be cool. I remember going to parties and the parents, like in high school, the parents would be drinking with us. Right. I'm like, that's lame, man. What are you doing? Go to bed. It's 930. Not to say (laughs) that a parent can't party, but like, you know what I mean? Why are you trying so hard to be cool? It's, It's, how do you have a parent to have those difficult conversations, to be present with your child, to, to welcome those conversations, but to still have that parental role as a figure, um, of, I don't know if authority is the right word, but you still need to practice discipline, right? Is there, how do you toe that line? Do you want to be your son or daughter's best friend? I mean, I personally don't know that that's the the role of a parent. I, I think that I, you know. Let's start there. What's the role of a parent? Yeah, I don't, that's a good question. I think it's different for everybody, but I being your kid's best friend doesn't necessarily it's a hard, that's a hard one. You know, I, I'm not a, for me, I think you can, under, you have to give your kids their freedom. They want to hang out with their friends, right? So I think that's, again, we got to get out of our own way. What kind of a parent do you want to be? Do you want to be your kid's best friend? But then how does that help when you get into the challenging disciplinary times? You know, so it's that, of course, we want to be friends with our kids and we want to have relationships with our kids, but we also have to hold a safe space for them and we have to be able to help them in this, I like to call it a safe container because really by the time they're 18, they're out into the real world and they don't have that safe Mm -hmm. container for us. So we, for me, I like to think of it as we want to have our kids make all of those mistakes in a safe container rather than be fully perfect. If your kid doesn't make mistakes until they move out, they're going to make the mistakes. So we're all going to make mistakes. And so it's giving them the ability to make those mistakes so that they can pick themselves up off the floor and have the confidence to do it. Because if they can't do it when they're living at home, how are they going to do it when they're living on their own? Right. Right. So is that being their best friend? Is that really the most, is that the healthy, I'm not a parent expert, 
I don't know how parent. healthy I'm but a parent. A parent. Yes. So, you know, I don't look at it as being my kid's best friend. Uh-huh. Do I want to have a healthy relationship with them? Yes. Do I want them to know that they can come to me and talk about anything? Yes. You know, yeah. do I want them to have a safe space and know that they're not going to be judged? And I would rather they come to me than go to Google. Yeah. I also recognize they're going to talk to other people and have, you know, as long as they have somebody that they can talk to, I think that's really, really, really important. So... I think there's a danger in becoming your kid's best friend right. that way. I, you know, I think that parents live, they're not being honest with themselves. And then how do you, I'm not big on discipline, but I think you have to have consequences. The life, you know, that's the world we live in. We have mm-hmm. consequences. If, you know, if you break the law, there's going to be a consequence to that. And yeah. so we have to be able to help teach these things to our kids so they better understand. Um, if we're best friends with our kids, I don't know if... That's right. The, well, because they because once you lay that consequence on there, what what happened? I thought you were my best bud. You're punishing me. I think the best consequences are the ones that come naturally. When you do something wrong, there's a natural consequence. I remember I uh, was suspended a few times in grade seven, seven and eight. One uh, a friend of mine, we were breaking uh, coat racks in the change room. It was really fun. You kicked them, they smashed. Oh, <laughs> oh it was so much fun doing karate kicks. And the the custodian comes in. He's like, "What are you doing?" Brings us to the principal's office, and uh, suspended. And my dad figured this out, and my mom. And they're just like, "That is so stupid, that they're sending you home." I would love Scott for you to pay for some new coat racks. You get a drill from the custodian. You yeah. guys replace all of them yourselves. And that's the consequence. Yeah. Money out of your own bank. But the suspension thing, that still happens? Yeah. What? What is such an unnatural way to punish yeah. someone? So I think, I don't know where I was going with that, but it's really interesting that, that you think the best friend idea doesn't work. And I think a lot of people... Uh, would would definitely agree. Well, do you would you when you were a teenager? Did you want your parents to be your best friend? Oh my gosh, no! That was the cringiest thing ever. Exactly. Yeah. And And then we we then we impose ourselves on our kids, right? We impose ourselves in their lives, and mm. then we want them to talk about things that best friends talk about. But from a kid's perspective, it's like you're nosy. Why are you getting in my business? Give me my space. You know, let me live my life. And that we have to let them do that. We have to give them that space to do that because. Yes. Otherwise, they become codependent on us. Mm-hmm. And that's not a healthy way to raise your kids, right? So, yes, they go as teenagers. Maybe we didn't want them as friends. But as you become older, we sometimes will circle back. And our relationships over time change with our parents, right? Oh. And so it's just giving that space. I mean, now I'm in my 40s. My relationship with my mom is very different than when I was a of teenager. Of course. Yeah, you start a business together. <laughs> but but I, but I it's probably the same, you know, your late 20s, your relationship can change. I think that it's just we have to give our kids that space and allow them to make those mistakes and recognize their brains are developing. You know, I have a 13-year-old and I remember saying to a, an expert, saying like, I feel like he lives offline all the time. He just, he's an incredibly smart kid and he makes such stupid choices. And she's like, yeah, his brain is offline. That's exactly what's happening, you know? And I think as parents, Mm. we forget that. We forget that there's so much going on and we expect them to be these really responsible adults, but it doesn't work like that. We got to give them that space Mm -hmm. to be silly and make silly mistakes and you're right there should be a better system of consequences in place like right. suspending kids do- that doesn't teach them anything other right. than to continue to act out and you don't have to go to school right right that's what that teaches you and it's going to be a problem for parents if you're a working parent that is a huge problem then the accountability goes on to the parent now right, right. now they have to figure out how to make this work the th- the biggest reason why you know i'm so biased hi mom hi dad if you're listening uh, you know, I'm very biased because I think they're the best parents in the world. But the reason that we all were so open with my parents and we could talk about a lot is because everything we shared, whether it be homework, what we learned, what we didn't like, accomplishments, they would be and show excitement. Yeah. That is... When something good happens, what what do you want to do once it feels good? You obviously go and you want to share because you can only get so much uh, so much serotonin and yeah. dopamine on your own. So you want to share and it kicks you into high gear and you feel even better sharing that with someone. 
But the reason you share with people and you share with certain people is that they get excited for you. That's what friends are for. I feel like if, if parents, and I think it comes to getting out of your own way and like being excited for your kid and, and showing that interest, that like they'll open up like if they're anything like me. They'll open up right away because they're like, oh my gosh, they're going to get a kick out of this once I tell them. And you get excited to tell them because they get excited for you. That's that beautiful exchange between people too, not just parents. Is that something you you hear from a lot from, from teens and parents? Or is that one of the one of the gateways into curiosity is that excitement well it's interesting so what you're talking about or what i hear you're talking about is when you're curious with somebody and you have understanding you actually have a mind heart opening and your body releases oxytocin which is a feel-good drug so when you're having conversations with people and we've most of us have had them i've met people who haven't but the majority of us have them it could be when you first meet a loved one you know in a first date or a best friend or a parent can you can have these conversations with your parents mm -hmm. where you do you you literally feel high afterwards right. right like you and because we are it's that feel good drug oxytocin is released in our body because we have understanding it's like wow i feel seen i feel heard i feel understood this person gets me mm that's it's a real thing yeah right and so that it comes from being curious from getting out of your own way to ask the questions to better understand somebody's perspective and again we don't have to like what we hear so when our kids come to us as you're saying and they're excited about what's going on and they're sharing their experience and they're sharing their perspective as a parent to just be open and listen so you can understand what's going on for your child of course you're going to be excited because you're understanding what's going on for your child. But when we listen, if we don't like what we hear, and then we listen from a place of judging it or shaming it or blaming it or, you know, like that's not right and you shouldn't have done that, then we actually release cortisol, the stress drug, right? And that's how we go into conflict. And that's where, so you've had those conversations, I know I've had these conversations where it's like, oh my gosh, I had the most amazing experience, right? And then somebody can hijack your conversation no i had the best experience <laughs> yeah. right i saw the most amazing movie and i want to share the one uppers with you, right it's yeah. like no i saw the best movie and that happens at all of our con and then we feel deflated it's like oh you're not listening to me and and let me tell me all the reasons why my movie is better mm -hmm. it's not how you build relationships right as just as you're talking about with your parents if you come home and you have something exciting to share you know, ma'am, I had the most amazing day. It was awesome. And I broke all of the hooks at school, right? But for you, maybe that was an amazing thing. And then right. we go, like, you can't do that. And judge, shame, judge, shame, right, right, wrong, right, wrong. It ends up in conflict. But if a parent can stay in a place to be like, okay, help me understand what was going on for you. I'm not saying that they're going to leave the conversation feeling amazing, but they're going to be able to have the conversation without being emotionally fraught, mm -hmm. you know? Because you're going to understand, well, I don't know, it was, it was, this is, these are the reasons I wanted to see whatever the reasons were, you know, it, it, it doesn't make it right. It just means that you understand where they're coming from. So yes. it's easier to have those difficult conversations. It's easier to stay in that place of ambiguity and it's easier to control your emotions when you're in curiosity than when you go to that place of right, wrong, judging, blaming, and shaming. Right. And I think as parents, we forget that. So you had, that's amazing. I love to hear those experiences with your parents because it sounds like they were present and they were open and they listened. And what that did is it gave you that, what I'm hearing you say is that it gave you the opportunity to go to them with anything because you knew that they would be there for you mm -hmm. and listen to you no matter what. And that's boom, like what else do you want from a parent? Exactly. Oh my gosh, there's the icing on the cake. If you have that, I don't like to use the word safe space, but if you feel safe and comfortable talking to your parent about anything, the parent is supposed to be the supportive role. Yes. And you're right. Again, I'm not a parent yet, but I can maybe empathize or at least sympathize with, let's say kids come home and they, they share something and imagine what they're sharing, you know, is completely like factually false. And like, did you know the Tesla cost $8.2 million to make? And you're like, oh, that's so wrong. Oh, my gosh. Immediately, I would be like, actually, I'd be the actually person, the actually dad. Actually, son, that's actually not what's up. But I feel like that that curiosity part, again, it, it's it, if you do the actually thing, it shuts down the conversation with your kids. But then furthering that with asking a question like, oh, where did you learn that? 
Exactly. And oh, really? Oh, let's talk about how a Tesla is made. What are, what are the steps? Where did that let's number learn. come from? Yeah. And hey, why don't we go on Google together and learn about this? Um, that it may take. Do you think it takes extra effort to have that curious mindset? <laughs> hundred percent. That's why it's easier to not have it. Right. You know, and that's the biggest feedback that I get from parents. What if I don't care? I don't want to understand my kid. I want my kid to do what I'm telling them to do. Mm, right. That's big. Let's repeat that one. Yeah. <laughs> and as parents, we do. We want, like, I've been there. I fully appreciate this. I, you know, in those moments, it's like, I don't really care what's going on for you right now. I want you to get off your video game. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I, don't, I want you to get in the car. I want you to do your homework. I, you know, it's that, those are the things in those moments. Parents, we're fried, we're done. It's like, I just want you to do what I'm telling you to do. Yeah. So then you, we have to go back to, okay, do we want our kids to be obedient or do we want our kids to be critical thinkers? And that it's hard in those moments, right? And there is a meme that goes around social media all the time. We want our kids to be critical thinkers until we want them to be obedient. Right. And that's, and it's a, it's a juggle. It really and truly is a juggle. Yes, it takes longer. A hundred percent, it takes longer in the upfront. But when you, it, in terms of asking questions, like you were saying before, yeah, you're going to have different conversations. That's why in school, teachers will shut kids down, like stop asking me questions. You yeah. know, as kids are younger, like, why is the sky blue? Why, 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 why? They're excited. They want to learn. And we're just like, for the love of God, don't ask me another question. I can't take it anymore. Yeah. yeah. So we shut them down. Um, parents shut it down too. No, that's not right. You know, did you know that a Tesla is $8 million? Actually, no, it's not. Yeah. And if you have enough of those conversations, your kid is going to stop coming to you because they're, the message they're getting is no matter what I tell my parents, it's not right. Bingo. There's a cortisol. You see your parent as almost a threat now of giving you nothing satisfying or good. Let's just pause. Can I have your attention, please? Can I have your attention, please? We are now conducting an in-suite test of the fire alarm system for the 24th floor. I repeat, we are now conducting an in-suite test of the fire alarm system for the 24th floor. Does that mean we have to leave? No, it's just a test, and it's just for the floor. You spoke about... um, I've heard of helicopter parenting, mm-hmm. or in 2019, drone parenting. Yeah. But what, what's snowplow parenting? Oh, snowplow parenting is when you clear the path for them. Oh. Right? So it's, you know, parents just clear the path rather than, what's the saying where you need to prepare them for the path, not, like, there's not a saying create the path it. Or, yeah, something or something like, yes. But basically, they're clearing the path for them. Okay. Easy walking. Just, no yeah, stones. Exactly. No hurdles. Yeah. Okay. So I was at a... A mental health event for grade sevens and eights, and it was about um, you know stopping stigma, expressing yourself, being comfortable talking about your feelings. And beforehand, they had teachers come on and say, you know, students, you may feel triggered based on some of the content. So there's counselors, there's a psychologist, there's a public health nurse in the back. If you feel triggered, some of it might be triggering. Oh, I don't like that word. Yeah. But then there are supports for you. And I thought, is, is our trigger warnings, is this kind of mentality, are we crippling kids mentally and decreasing that resilience? It's okay. So what's inter- what comes up for me is I read an article recently about university and it was exactly the same thing where universities used to be places where you could go and talk about things, extreme perspectives that not everybody agreed with, but the point was to understand different perspectives and debate different perspectives to the point now where professors are losing their job because students are feeling triggered in the classroom and they feel like it's not a safe space. So, I mean, it is a bigger question, you know, for me, it's where, what is triggering these, where is that coming from? Where, how are students feeling unsafe or triggered in that moment? Whatever that looks like for them. Where right. It, it's different for everyone, di- though. Yeah. Like, what is the level of, of triggering and not triggering? What's triggering, you know, hey, uh, we have the fireplace on here. What if I had a past experience with uh, someone passing away in a house fire? And now a professor can't say fire because it's triggering for me. Does every lecture and every class need to say, hey, guys, we're talking about Christopher Columbus. This might be triggering for you. Yeah. Okay, like, where where's the line well and it's it, when it comes to stress and anxiety and and all the things that you know kids are feeling immensely right now it's i think it's also important to remember that for the average kid those are not bad things to feel. like we need stress in our life we need conflict in our relationships like we need that's a healthy part of how we live our life it's not 
it's not, you know, stress never causes the issue. Conflict never causes the issue. It's how we deal with it. Anxiety never causes the issue. It's how we deal with it. And it's different for everybody. So I think for me, it's a, again, it goes back to understanding. We have to understand where is it coming from? And, and, and it's going to look like different things for different people. And for some people, it's going to be more extreme than others. And it's not, you can't, it's not a one size fits all. It's finding out how do you work through it? What are the strategies that you need? What help do you need in order to work through it? Because otherwise we all become prisoners in our life. We're all going to be triggered no matter where we go. And that is not a successful way to live your life. You want right. to be able to work through these things. I have been to plenty of parent groups and especially around the holidays, I've read so many articles about how to have difficult conversations with family members. And a lot of them say, just avoid them. Oh, and that's no. not a strategy, oh, right? Like no. that is not a successful strategy. <laughs> we can't just avoid things that make us uncomfortable. We have to learn how to work through things that make us uncomfortable. We have to learn how to sit with feelings that are uncomfortable and work our way through it. But these are all things that we are not taught. We're just expected to know. So it's, it's, it goes back to that bigger picture of, you know, is, is it the chicken or the egg? Mm-hmm. And I think it's different for everybody. Do I think it's a productive way of holding a seminar or a workshop? No, I think kids need to learn this stuff. If we're prefacing it with these triggers, it's how productive is it? We're not giving them the tools that they need. Right, right. It, the analogy could be people or parents bubble wrap their kids or schools bubble wrap kids and sent out in the world and nothing can actually it should be more like a, like things can penetrate that so easily though right it's more like it's more like having somewhat of a a protective barrier but one that still you still have to deal with conflict when it comes up right and it, it's just really we, we're trying to protect kids from the sharp objects in the world rather than you know teaching them to to deal with these things and not necessarily be on high alert but really know how know how to deal with anxiety to be comfortable with being uncomfortable yeah like the search for happiness for kids is like what can i do to feel joy in the moment right now for as long as possible so i'll go home and play video games i'll go home and go online because it's comfortable it feels good so when something terrible happens someone gets triggered we talk about anxiety you see a disturbing image it's like the their world collapses in front of them it's the end of the world the breakup is the end of the world although that's pretty normal actually yeah. but do you know what i mean it's like you gotta so work through it how do you, you gotta work pick through up it? the pieces and you gotta work through yeah. it uh, yeah we have to find ways to be more comfortable i mean i when i talk to parents about it, it especially when it comes to emotions first parents need to learn how to manage their emotions before they can expect their kids to learn how to manage their emotions, right? So it's kind of the same thing. And and we're all uncomfortable with being uncomfortable. And that's something that just as humans, we need to be more comfortable with. If you can teach your kid to be uncomfortable, be comfortable being uncomfortable, you know, I mean, when you look at the most successful people in the world, that is what they talk about. I had to learn how to be comfortable being uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. That's where the magic happens, right? Mm-hmm. That's how we get out of our own way. Yes, life is hard. And there's this myth, I think, as parents, we want everybody to be happy. And we want our kids to be happy. But that's not real life. It's just not, you know? And and when you ask adults when you're most happy, it's because of the struggles they've had, right? Of having to pick themselves up out of those holes and had to have that resilience to get back up and try it again. You know, that, and I don't even like the word happy, but you know, that's when they're the most vibrant fulfilled, and fulfilled right? and you know, you're feeling all the feels, so to speak. That's because we had to do it ourselves. If we can't give our kids those skills, if we don't let them have those moments of uncomfort and help them pick them back up, it becomes paralyzing in university. And then it becomes paralyzing when you're living on your own. And then when you have a family, then what do you do? Yeah. So we ha- it's, it's hard. I'm not saying it's easy. We all need to learn how to get out of our own way and become comfortable in uncomfort. That's the greatest gift that we can give our kids, you know, I think personally. I absolutely love it. Let's take that one away, everyone. You have to be comfortable with being uncomfortable and not being afraid to get out of your own way, too. I think there's a fear that that if you're not in it for yourself, that you'll you'll somehow lose your business, lose your sense of self, not being able to self-improve if you take that attention away from yourself. 
But meanwhile, like actually putting effort into understanding other people makes us better human beings, makes us more empathetic through empathy. Geez, maybe that changes the way you run your business. That maybe changes the way you interact with your boss, your coworkers, lets you see the world in a different way, um, makes you change paths. Who knows? But to to be open and understand, I think that's the, the most beautiful thing with, with parents. And, and that's what gets kids to open up. The Institute of Curiosity, that's that's the most beautiful thing in the world. <laughs> I would just throw in one more thing. Yeah. Don't be afraid to understand yourself. I think for me, it started with understanding myself. Mm. It was paying attention to how am I showing up in relationships? How am I showing up in my conversations? Am I, you know, how curious I, am I about other people? Am I speaking to be heard or am I listening to understand? How many yeah buts are coming out of my mouth, right? In that term, because I thought I was an amazing communicator, but I was really good at fixing and solving which people don't want to be fixed and solved, especially your kids don't want to be fixed and solved. And you know, I, I, and I thought I was helping. So I think when we take that step back and have that self-awareness and be curious, we have to be curious with ourselves. You know, what makes us tick? Yes. What kind of a person do we want to be? And have that awareness of how we're showing up in conversations and how we're showing up in life. Are we showing up with awe and beauty around us? Or are we showing up busy and overwhelmed and just checking off our to-do list, getting from thing to thing to thing to thing, right? Because right? how we, that's going to be a huge difference in how we live our life and how we interact with people and the choices that we make and, you know, our level of joy in our life. So start with self while also understanding other. Mm. And it's a two-part thing with curiosity. But I think that the more that you understand yourself, it's easier to understand others. But if you want to understand others first, then it will help you understand yourself. Either way, go back to understanding. <laughs> That's a beautiful way to end it. Kirsten, thank you so much for coming on. Everyone, um, the website is below in the description. Do you have Instagram? Yeah, I'm not good at it. I haven't really been doing it. Good. I shared that thing with you about the babies of uh, yes. you know, Instagram. Yes. That's a whole, my yes. gosh. Parenting pressure, uh, you know, with, with raising kids and what do you share online? Hey, your, your baby, your son or daughter, there's no consent there. What are they going to be? They're going to be all grown up seeing naked pictures of themselves on Facebook in the tub. Like, what is... That's strange to me. I, well, I want to have you on. I want to do our own thing about that because I think parents have a lot of questions around that. And I, there's mm. a lot of, there's a, they just don't know. I think that they're, they feel like to be successful, they should be doing it a certain way without understanding what the repercussions are. Yes, completely. The natural consequence of things. Yeah. Oh, there are some with social media. My friends, if you're interested, uh, if there are, if there are any teachers or parents listening, uh, Kristen and I are doing, uh, we're going to be doing some talks together for parent groups in Toronto. Please feel free to email me, email her and uh, get more info. Like this is a, a dynamic duo <laughs> here with, with presentations. I think it's going to be amazing. Our first one, uh, we're going to be doing a presentation at a private school on December 17th for parents of, of grade five students. That's going to be amazing. I'm excited. Excited? Awesome. I'm excited. See, if you're excited, then I'm excited. I love That's it. I think it's going to be a beautiful great. thing. Thanks so much, Kirsten. Everyone stay strong. Keep being you and don't forget to express yourself.